Hey guys, Dr. Brandon Crawford here. I'm the founder of the Austin Center for Developing Minds. Uh, we are located just north of Austin, Texas in Cedar Park. And what we do is we focus on developmental functional neurology. Hopefully you'll have a chance to catch my lecture because I'm going to be taking you through what that process looks like and why it's so important to focus on rehabbing the brain in the right way uh, at the right time with the right frequency and oscillations and all this kind of stuff, right? So I'm very honored to be a part of this conference. Uh, this conference is very meaningful. I love all the people involved and obviously the cause is fantastic. So thank you again and I look forward to seeing you soon. Hey everyone, Dr. Brandon Crawford here. So I am co-founder of the company Shed Light. Shed Light is a company that focuses on the use of laser and light therapy to improve the health and wellness of the brain and body. Um, we're happy and excited to be a part of this uh, conference. And so, you know, if you have any more questions or want any information regarding how laser and light therapy can improve your health, please check us out. Go to uh, shedlightcoldlasers.com. Thanks. And rehabilitation at Dell Children's. And I'm going to be talking a bit today about spasticity management. Uh, the title of the talk is Spasticity Management, a Physiatrist's Perspective. A physiatrist is an another name for a physical medicine rehab doctor. And I titled it that, as you'll see through some of this, I talk about some of the aspects to managing spasticity that I think is a little different for a, a PMNR or a, a physical medicine rehab doctor thinking about function and not just solely about um, a spastic muscle or a, a spastic group of muscles. Um, so yeah, I'll just jump right in. Uh, I don't have any connections with any of these companies, but uh, just to note, a lot of the medications that are used for spasticity, especially in children, is off-label use, meaning that it's not directly approved to use by the FDA. Uh, so I wanna make sure that I make note of that. So what are we gonna be talking about? We're gonna talk about what spasticity is, uh, how we assess it or measure it, and then how we treat it. Uh, and within that, some of the kind of treatment um, algorithms or pathways that are considered. So first, what, what is spasticity? So this, pardon for having so many words on one slide, uh, but I think this is a helpful um, uh, juxtaposition of the way two different groups think about spasticity. So the first, the top one is from a group called USPASM. That's a long acronym. I don't remember what it is, but it's the European Consortium for uh, Neurologic Disorders, and this one's specifically about spasticity. And this is their definition for spasticity, which is a disordered sensory motor control resulting from an upper motor neuron lesion presenting as intermittent or sustained involuntary activation of muscles. So the, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of information there in, in a pretty sh short number of words, but the important things are that they mentioned sensory motor control, an upper motor neuron lesion, and this is involuntary activation of muscles. Uh, con contrast that with, uh, this is from a book called De Jong's Neurologic Examination, uh, this is a much longer and kind of a little bit cryptic sometimes definition, but it's a state of sustained increase in tension of muscle when it is passively lengthened. This tension is caused by an exaggeration of the muscle stretch reflex. There is increased sensitivity to stimulation of proprioceptive receptors within the muscles, and such stimulation causes the shortening reactions to be intensified and the muscular tension to be augmented. Again, kind of highlighting the important things noted here is that they're talking about muscle that is passively lengthened, the muscle stretch reflex and increased sensitivity. So I'm gonna go back to these definitions, not just putting the words up there, but mentioning these kind of individual aspects that I've highlighted out of each one uh, when we talk about what spasticity is. And so I think that for me, the next way that I typically think about it, one, because it's helpful in the way that I examine patients, but then the second thing is that it's helpful when we look at treatments and why we might, or why any, any clinician might recommend one treatment over another is, is the anatomy. Uh, so specifically looking at what we call the, the reflex loop. So, you know, you go to the doctor, they pull out the reflex hammer, they tap on your knees, your leg goes, everybody high fives each other or laughs or whatever. It's always entertaining, but really it's, this is the, the heart of a lot of what happens in spasticity. And so in this loop, essentially it's the 
sensory aspect of the musculoskeletal system in both the muscles and the tendons, sending information from those organs through a nerve back to the spinal cord, interacting with the alpha motor neuron or the, the neuron that sends a signal from the spinal cord out to a muscle to tell it to contract, sending the muscle, sending that signal to tell it to contract. So what happens when you go to the doctor and they tap on your knee, they're tapping the patellar tendon, it just causes a really brief and even small but fast stretch of the quadriceps, your, your big thigh muscles. Uh, muscle that causes these uh, nerves, the ones that are highlighted in blue, that to send a signal back to your spinal cord to say, hey, we got stretched, we should pull back. So they pull back, it causes a contraction, your leg kicks out. That's this reflex loop that we all have that is active, you know, assuming you have intact muscle, nerve, and a spinal cord, these things all uh, uh, function properly. And again, with this idea that it's protecting your muscle. This reflex loop is not just important just for protecting muscle. It's actually one of the main ways we control movement, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But this idea is that this reflex loop is active, but gets controlled from above, from areas above it in the spinal cord, areas above it in the brain that control its up and down level of activity. And so they can make this reflex loop a little bit more active or make it less active to help control some activity. Um, and so, but understanding the role of spasticity in this is important. And so going back to those definitions, right? The second definition talks about the muscle stretch reflex. This is specifically what they're mentioning and an increased sensitivity to stimulation, meaning that some of these minor stimulations like the tap of the reflex hammer have a bigger response, right? So people that have spasticity frequently have increased reflexes or hyperreflexia as well, very common. Uh, other sign that we see in upper motor neuron lesions. And so that's upper motor neuron was one of the things that was highlighted in the first definition. So an upper motor neuron lesion is a, a lesion in the brain or spinal cord for the nerve that's leading from the part of the brain that tells us to move in a, a part of the body coming down to the part where it interacts with this alpha motor neuron we see here in pink or magenta. So the simplest way we think about these is that there's two nerves, one in your brain that starts in your brain and comes down through your spinal cord, and then one in the spinal cord that comes out and goes to the muscle. That's the simplest way we think about the motor pathway. Uh, and so when we say an upper motor neuron lesion, we mean it's the one that starts in your brain. So anything in the brain or the spinal cord can damage that nerve, leading to this uh, upper motor neuron syndrome, which includes spasticity, hyperreflexia, some of these other things that we've mentioned. And so again, like I said, thinking about this is helpful, one, to understand what spasticity is, but then two, to think about treatments. And so we can think about where medications are acting and it helps us understand one, its effect, but also its side effects, which sometimes is more important when we're thinking about which treatment we're gonna use. The last thing that I'll mention is that the second definition talks about passive stretch. So that's this kind of increased sensitivity. You stretch muscle much like during a reflex when you tap on somebody's knee. Uh, and, it, and it increases those. So one of the things you'll frequently see when clinicians assess spasticity is to stretch a muscle. So for example, they might you know, pull on my arm to stretch my biceps muscle like this. That's frequently to see how easy it is to elicit this increase in tone, again, that everyone has, but that it's changes in its amount depending on other problems like with this upper motor neuron syndrome. So Moving on from that, and we'll go back to this talking about kind of how we think about treatments in that specific scenario of the anatomy. How do we measure it? So there are several ways we can measure it clinically, meaning a clinician at the bedside and what they're going to do. Uh, range of motion is probably one of the most common. How is the, does the joint have the full range of motion or does spasticity lead to a reduction in the range of motion? And if so, what is how much is that range of motion reduced? The second most common is the, what's called the modified Ashworth scale. So as this implies, there's an Ashworth scale as well. This is the modified version. And in the next slide, I'll go through in detail kind of the levels of that. This is by far the most widely used clinical scale of spasticity because it doesn't need anything special. You don't need a, a goniometer or anything else. You just need uh, a person who's familiar with the scale. You also see some of the downsides because it doesn't use anything standardized. So there's some subjectivity related to it. The TARDU scale is a more um, in-depth assessment of spasticity that uses a goniometer or a joint angle measurement device where they look at when the spasticity or increase in tone is first felt and when there's like a, a stop in that. And so you'll get these various degree values for different joints, um, a little bit more complicated to apply. So it's typically not done at the bedside as much because it, it uh, uh, takes special equipment and, and sometimes too long.
some physical therapists or uh, occupational therapists will use this pretty frequently though um, as well. And it's used in research quite a bit. Outside of those clinical um, measurements, though, there's also more functional measurements. And so somebody's reach, someone's ability to dress themselves or someone's ability to have uh, care tasks performed on them, like they're getting dressed or you know a diaper to be changed, those kinds of things are more functional measurements. Then you get even complicated functional measurements such as gait. And then lastly, something that kind of falls in a, in a mixed category, but pain, uh, right? Because there's some subjectivity on the patient side. How do you assess that in someone who has minimal ability to communicate that? But it is what I consider a functional aspect in the sense of you're trying to decrease pain so they can do more things uh, through the use of, of uh, spasticity management. Um, and so these things, you know, we can do several different things to try to address those in a more objective fashion. And so a, a good example that I will frequently do is Patients that uh, uh, propel their own wheelchair that have spasticity, I'll we'll think about how their reach is impacted with propelling their wheelchair and how does that impact their ability to get themselves around in their own wheelchair, whether it's a manual wheelchair or a power wheelchair, or dressing themselves similarly, how much help do they need when they're, uh, when they're dressing themselves or getting dressed. So to go into a little bit more detail, and again, a slide with a lot of uh, words, this is the scale for the modified Ashworth scale, or you can see the number. So basically it's a zero to four measurement with, with only one kind of in-between measurement of a one plus, where zero is no increase in muscle tone, so not no tone in their muscle, because again, tone is normal. There's a normal amount of tone, but no more than normal increase in tone. Uh, a one is a slight increase in tone that's usually in the second half uh, or the, the end of the range of motion. So again, going back to my elbow, it would be past 90 degrees. You feel an increase in the resistance. Uh, a one plus is when that happens in the, in the beginning part or the first half of the of the range of motion. The a number two would be a marked increase in tone. This is where the subjectivity comes in. What is a marked increase, right? That also depends on the size of the patient, the size of their muscle. So measuring that in a in a two year old is very different than measuring that in a sixteen year old. Uh, and so this is where the skill starts to have a little bit of difficulty in its inter-rater reliability or how we measure it one clinician to the next or even within the clinician between visits. Uh, three, also some vague terminology, considerable increase in muscle tone. And then four gets a little bit more concrete in that you, it's a joint you can't move. And so it's actually indistinguishable from a contracture where you can't move it because it's, it's just rigid in the joint. Uh, but two and three get where it's a little bit more vague. Again, I highlight the scale because it's used quite a bit. Um, and this is the scale that I, I typically try to use when I'm assessing patients. So now, now moving on to uh, treatments, again, I'm going to pull up this reflex diagram. And again, it, I think this is helpful, at least to me, to understand where um, medications or other treatments are acting to help understand the, the effect and the possible side effects that they have. So first, oral medications. And so there's you know, many different oral medications that are present or that we use for spasticity management. Uh, some of these medications act centrally. So you see on the on the right side here, gabapentin and trihexaphenidyl are medications. I have the arrow pointing up, meaning that the the idea is they mostly occur. Their, their effect is mostly in the brain for spasticity. They both have effects even peripherally, um, and then also in the spinal cord. But the effect for spasticity is thought to mostly come from their uh, uh, mechanism of action in the brain. Now, the next ones all occur in the spinal cord. So all of these medications also have effects in the brain, but the effect of spasticity is thought to be primarily in the spinal cord. And this is important because one of the big things we think about any medication that acts in the brain or the spinal cord, or what we call the central nervous system, those medications, when they're ingested, have to go through what's called the blood-brain barrier or through a, a more difficult kind of layer in our body to to cross over from part of our, the rest of our body from where the brain is separate from that. That's important because typically the concentrations need to be a lot higher to cross that barrier. And so you might get effects from, from these medications outside the uh, blood-brain barrier before you get the, the effect you want inside the blood-brain barrier in the central nervous system. Also, if it's only active in the spinal cord, and so therefore you need high concentrations to get it into the spinal cord area, you might need high concentrations also in the brain or some of the side effects for that medication may be. And then you'll see over here all by its lonesome dantrolene. Dantrolene is a muscle relaxer, which is the only muscle relaxer actually that acts in the muscle. The rest of them all act in the nervous system, but dantrolene actually acts in the muscle. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, later about uh, how that's important for its, again, effect, but also potential side effects. 
The next things are injectables. So uh, botulinum toxin is injected directly into the muscle. Botulinum toxin works by essentially chemically disconnecting a nerve from the muscle. So the nerve is still physically connected, but the communication between that nerve and the muscle gets shut down. This is a dose dependent phenomenon, meaning that if we put a little bit of botulinum toxin into a muscle, some of those won't be as active, but you'll still have a lot of them that are active. And if you put a lot in, almost none of them. So you can essentially completely deactivate that nerve's ability to activate that muscle. So it won't turn on at all anymore. Uh, phenol, on the other hand, or other alcohols are injected into the nerve. They cause some local nerve damage, which prevent that nerve's ability to send signals. Uh, it actually acts uh, both in the motor aspect of it, but then also in the sensory aspect, meaning the, the kind of aqua or blue part and also this pink part. So it decreases the signals up the spinal cord as well as down, and you kind of decrease the activity of this loop. And then finally, surgeries. Um, there's more surgeries than this because you also have the uh, kind of tendon lengthening, things like that, muscle, muscle uh, lengthenings. But selective dorsal rhizotomy goes in and cuts only the these, this aqua or this blue fiber, so only the sensory nerves, decreasing the activity of this loop. Again, and only the nerves you, this is active in. Then I also highlight over here baclofen as one of the treatments that uh, many people may be familiar with is intrathecal baclofen or the same medication baclofen, but instead of taken orally and then over the whole body, it's delivered directly to the spinal cord with a pump. It's in the abdomen and a catheter that goes into the spinal column. Uh, this is very advantageous because one, it delivers it locally so you get less side effect in the sense of spread over the whole body. But the bigger aspect also is there is some targeting. You can't really control left and right and the up and down targeting is not perfect, but there's some degree of up and down targeting because you can put the end of that catheter at different levels in the spinal cord to get different concentrations in different areas. Um, and so now thinking about this and what these treatments do, I kind of highlighted it as I was talking about some of these, but the big things are that when you think about weakness as a as a result of some of these treatments, right? We're trying to decrease muscle tone, but at the same time, maintain weak, maintain strength in that given muscle. Any treatment that acts in the, in the pink nerve here or the alpha motor neuron or in the muscle can cause weakness, generally speaking. So uh, phenol can cause weakness because you can decrease that activity of that nerve to where it can't activate uh, that muscle enough to the strength that was needed before botulinum toxin can cause weakness, actually directly causes weakness, but sometimes too, too much, let, uh, decreasing the activity of that muscle too much where it's clinically important weakness. Dantrolene also can cause weakness that, uh, that comes up. And then the rest of these in, in general are thought not to directly cause weakness. Uh, they can sometimes cause what seems like weakness, but frequently what that is is not weakness, but it's a decrease in tone that uh, a given patient was using. So a good example of that is if someone has truncal tone, if they have increased tone in their in their spinal column or things like that, muscles around their spinal column that are keeping them upright more so, and you increase these medications, you can see that as that tone decreases, there may not be strength in those muscles to maintain posture, and so posture can get worse. Uh, this is this is a relatively known phenomenon, especially in the therapy world, of where there can be too much of this medication because the tone is sometimes helpful for certain certain activities. And then again, as I highlighted before, the mechanism of action of some of the medications, especially on the right side being central, you can see side effects related to sedation or other central side effects that can happen because of these different medications. So that's a lot of information about different medication side effects, all that kind of stuff. So then what does that mean for when a patient comes in the office or is in the hospital and we're trying to look at them and say, hey, what, what should we do? What, what is the first line? Is it a medication? Is it a an injection? Is it a, a surgery? What, what should we do first? And so there was a paper published, um, um, I think it was, let's see, I have it at the bottom of the slide, two, in 2000 by uh, Dr. Graham. Dr. Graham is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon in Australia who has quite a bit of literature in the cerebral palsy population, who uh, most of the real, most of the research has for spasticity in children has come out of cerebral palsy. There's been some studies in brain injury and other things but for the most part, it's mostly cerebral palsy. And he's, he's a big researcher in cerebral palsy. And in that, it's kind of a paper talking about kind of the, um, the role of botulinum toxin in this treatment, but also kind of the general idea of how we should consider these treatments as a whole in a given, in a given patient. And they have this graph, which I really like. And if there's anybody listening that's had discussion with me in clinic, I'd probably draw this on paper, not to this specificity, but you've probably seen something similar to this. 
And what they do on this graph is they plot different treatments on uh, uh, two axes, one being how, how reversible on the left side or permanent is the treatment. And then uh, on the vertical axis, how general, meaning how much over the whole body is it going versus how focal, how targeted can we be? Uh, I'll tell you that from the reference here, I added one, the blue circle with physical modalities. I added, I'm a physical medicine rehab doctor, so I, I do like physical modalities that they didn't include in this paper. So one of the things you'll see right are things I've already highlighted to some degree. Oral, oral therapy or oral medications, right, goes everywhere in the body. We can't control where it goes. You take the pill, you absorb it, it goes in your bloodstream, it goes everywhere. So it's very general. It's also very reversible. So when you stop taking the medication, it stops its activity. Intrathecal baclofen is medication based so it's very similar to that except that it's slightly less uh, uh general because you can target the height of this catheter and while the medication is extremely reversible it's a surgery to do it. and the surgery obviously causes some permanent changes uh related to the surgery and so it's not exactly permanently or, or completely reversible there's some permanence to this even though the medication can be stopped and the, and the pump can be removed uh, and the in the quadrant below that, you'll see there's physical modality. So, you know, I, what I usually explain here is this is like stretching being the first, right? Stretching is extremely focal. You're targeting one muscle group. Um, it's also very reversible. Stretching has been shown to cause a decrease in spasticity for somewhere around, you know, 20 to 40 minutes, um, where you can see a change in spasticity directly related to the stretching, but it, it's pretty minimal. Also down here is also botulinum toxin. This is, you know, BTXA. Sometimes you also see it as BONT, which is botulinum neurotoxin. Uh, these are just different acronyms for botulinum toxin. Uh, it, it's very targeted in that we can inject a specific muscle for that uh, treatment. Uh, and it's also you know, reversible, but it's less reversible than oral medication because it does have some duration of efficacy. You know, usually it's in the range of three to six months for spasticity. Now moving up to the top right quadrant, you see here SDR, which is selective dorsal rhizotomy. That was the surgery I had mentioned on the uh, previous slides where the sensory nerves are cut for spastic muscle groups, extremely permanent. Those sensory nerves do not grow back. Uh, but it's also, you know, while they put it up high, as high in the general category, I actually would put it a little bit lower in that you do try to target only the spastic muscle groups. Uh, so hopefully you can be pretty targeted in how you do that, but it's not 100% of you're only getting exact muscles that are purely spastic. And then surgery and selective dorsal rhizotomy is a surgery, so that's a little misleading, as well as intrathecal baclofen. Surgery, what they mean here is um, uh, tendon lengthenings and those kinds of things. So you can be pretty focal with those because you only go after specific muscle groups. Um, and they're also permanent in that usually or almost never do they shorten tendons. It's, that can be extremely difficult. So uh, pretty much just lengthened. So probably one of the most important things I, I think in spasticity management in general is goal setting. This idea of we're trying to treat something that is not going to go away for most patients, but we're trying to do that for a specific reason. So understanding that reason and being pretty explicit about it is helpful. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to treat spasticity. And so you can get catch yourself in a situation of it has done something, but you're not sure what that something is, and you don't know if it's helped at all. And that's a bad place to be because then you don't know if you should continue the treatment or not. And when I say bad place to be, it's a bad place to be for myself as a, as a provider delivering these treatments, but also for the family because they feel like they're not guided on where they should go. So I've kind of split up these categories in for different goals you can have, um, mo mostly because this is reflective in a, in a paper that, uh, that I'll discuss in a, in a minute. Uh, so functional goals, kind of like we talked about before, reaching, walking, grasping, transfers, gait, all or walking, all these kinds of things. I've walking on there twice, apologize. Uh, and uh, uh, care would mean dressing some, maybe diapering, also getting into a proper seating position. I have that in both care, but then also in the pain section because sometimes improper seating can also cause pain. And then the pain, joint position, muscle pain, and, and uh, seating, these are all appropriate goals for botulinum toxin, but it's good to understand what's the goal you're starting it for so that you can say, hey, were we successful? Did we achieve that goal or not? So you can know whether you should continue with that treatment or potentially change it. And the, the thing that I want to highlight as well as, a, as part of this is that we have on the left side functional goals. And the rest of these are all um, you know, non-functional goals, even though pain I consider kind of somewhat to be a functional goal. 
The important thing to realize is that spasticity, as that first definition said, is disordered sensory motor control, and the and then later said involuntary activation of muscles. Tight muscles, when we redo reduce how much their uh, spasticity is, when we reduce their tightness, does it mean that the when the tightness is gone, what's left is an extremely functional grouping of muscles. Uh, it's not infrequent that we see a successful treatment in that spasticity is reduced, but an unsuccessful treatment in that the goal was increased reach and usability of a limb, let's say. Um, and that just doesn't happen. And that can happen, that can be for a number of reasons, but I would say the most frequent reason that happens is that underneath all that spasticity, there was not motor control. And so I, I come back to this slide again, which I, I find very helpful to understand what spasticity is and what we're doing about it. We're essentially only acting here. I had a couple of things, you know, that I showed act above in the brain, but for the most part, we're only acting here. We're, in reality, the problem is above, right? This is an upper motor neuron lesion, which is not shown on this slide at all. And in upper motor neuron lesions, there can be varying degrees of motor control, meaning there's a varying degree of how much that patient has the ability to activate and deactivate a muscle on command. I want to, you know, flex my bicep with strength, or I want to relax my bicep to let my arm straighten out. These kinds of things. And so, if there's not very good motor control underneath all that spasticity, when you decrease the tone, there may not be improved function. So that's, an, I think, an important thing for uh, both providers and, and patients and their families to understand. Um, and that's going back to this idea of what's the goal? Because if the goal is I want to make someone looser so that getting them dressed is easier, then getting them looser is the goal. And so when they're looser, that you've achieved the goal. But if the goal is to get someone looser so that they can drive their own power chair more easily, increase their reach, those kinds of things. And when you make them looser in their muscles, they don't have the motor control to be able to do that. Then you have to think, okay, now is their looseness still an advantage for what, what else is going on in their life from a functional perspective, or is it not? And we should stop doing the treatment. That's the reason why the goals can sometimes be important. Um, so moving on from goals, I'm going to talk about that paper that I mentioned. So this is, again, a cerebral palsy uh, paper, which I know is not pertinent to all the populations that um, are affected by spasticity, but it's the uh, diagnosis that has the most research for spasticity in children. And so I like these papers. You're not meant to be able to read the words on this. And so I'll highlight some things more specifically so you guys can see. But I like this paper because it's a uh, graphically very nice to look at, but it also stratifies things in a way that you understand, one, how how positive is the evidence to suggest that a treatment is effective, but then also how much evidence there is. So this is called a traffic light evidence um, for obvious reasons, but the things that are important are right. Green means go, it's good, good things. There's lots of evidence to show this is effective, but then also the size of the circle indicates how much um, evidence is for that treatment, basically off of what types of studies there are and then how many of those studies with these really big circles, meaning that there's I want to say it's more than 10 randomized controlled trials in that group specifically. So that's, a, that's quite a lot of evidence. And so you'll see here, as I go through some of these things where I highlight some specific treatments, some things that we do still actually are kind of in this middle range. And then hopefully I try to avoid a lot of these things underneath this dotted line, which they affectionately call the worth it line. We stuff below that's just not worth it. You probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, but again, you'll see some of these things have really small amount of evidence. And so then you have to think, okay, is it not worth it? Or is it lower, you know, kind of in the middle of this group because it doesn't, doesn't have enough evidence yet? Or, or what, should we, what should we be thinking about for that specific intervention? So tone improvement, meaning not about function. This is just, can you reduce how tight their muscles are? You'll see here that, uh, you know, there's quite a few things at the top that we frequently use. So botulinum toxin, um, intrathecal baclofen, uh, let's see, oral baclofen is up here, diazepam or Valium is up here uh, as, as very high as well. Those ones are all on the high side. Down on the lower side is a lot of other things, some that I, I still use actually. So gabapentin is down there, tizanidine is down there, uh, dantrolene, triaxophenadil uh, are all um, down at the bottom. Stretching, stretching is at the bottom of tone improvement, right? So in the studies that are highlighted in this, is, is part of it is about does that stretching result in a significant decrease in tone that's, that's long-term, right? And as we discussed before, and I think as probably anybody that's ever been around someone with spasticity and taking care of them realizes that this is minimal effectiveness that's long. Is it a bad idea to do? I would wholeheartedly disagree with that and say that stretching is a good idea to do. If nothing else, it's advantageous for a family member or a caregiver to understand 
how bad their spasticity is so that if it worsens, it's something that could be investigated. Uh, but it is at the bottom of this, meaning that we shouldn't be doing it. But I think we shouldn't be doing it because of its impact on their tone directly. Motor improvement, this is a big category that generally looks at a lot of different measures. So all these studies have a little bit different measurements, but along the lines of functional things. So their ambulation, their reach, all those kinds of things. Um, and as you'll see here, it's a little bit more vague. There's some, a, lot of, a lot more things in the middle. Um, botulinum toxin is on here a number of times because several of these studies look at botulinum toxin in conjunction with other treatments. Um, uh, baclofen is still on here, intrathecal baclofen and oral baclofen. Uh, you know, traxafenadil and gabapentin are about in the same spot they were on the previous slide. So you'll see here that it's getting a little bit more vague when you get into the functional things, a lot of it being because these are difficult to measure. Pain improvement, and this, this gets into, right, where I was saying that there's just not mu that much evidence, right? A lot of these circles are smaller. And uh, one thing that I would, I guess I highly disagree with in the sense that one, it's a small circle, which I understand, but uh, in the sense of my cl own clinical experience is gabapentin. Gabapentin is pretty low on here with a pretty small circle. Uh, I don't know all of the literature for spasticity or for pain treatment with gabapentin in cerebral palsy specifically, but I, I can tell you that in my experience, painful spasticity has been most effectively treated with gabapentin. And it's probably my first line in, in the most effective line as well of treatment. Botulinum toxin and intrathecal baclofen are also frequently used as a pain treatment for painful spasticity um, and kind of have you know, middle of the road evidence. So just to highlight some of the studies that get included in this study, and I think it helps understand, I know this is kind of a very data heavy slide, but it understands how this literature is done, which can be helpful is uh, the specific study that's used in this, or one of the specific studies that's used in this for intrathecal baclofen, looked at a whole bunch of studies on intrathecal baclofen treatment in both cerebral palsy and then other uh, diagnoses. This slide only shows the cerebral palsy populations, but then they divided it based off of the domain of the International Classification of Function, which basically looks at uh, body disease, their individual's function, and then their participation. And so body function and structure essentially means what's their direct effect on tone, uh, the middle the middle meaning like their participation is activity, and then the, the last meaning, uh, sorry, not their participation, but their individual function, like their uh, activities, and the last participation, how does that affect their ability to get out and do other things and, and whatnot? So you see here for intrathecal baclofen, it's kind of all over the place. The only strong things I can say really are that the uh, you know they use the gross motor functional measurement GMFM for looking at activity changes, and it's pretty low, meaning that there is some effect, but but it's you know very minimal effect of intrathecal baclofen on improving those things. Yet in some aspects of uh, participation, and these were specifically looking at pain, extremely high. This is an effect size, meaning that the uh, change they note is like three times what the what the uh, expected change is, and so this is a this is a pretty big increase as far as its effect on pain um, for people that had painful spasticity. And then you'll see up here the uh, at the top, looking at tone directly, there's kind of a, a huge variation. The same study looked at other populations. These populations included uh, anoxic injuries. Uh, near drownings, and then um, head injuries, which they essentially is, de is defined as traumatic brain injuries, but that's a, it's a loose definition of traumatic brain injury. Um, and you'll see, similar to above, a, a pretty wide array of effect on spasticity directly. So this is tone. They don't look at other domains from the specific study. So this is kind of how an individual study gets formulated into that traffic light evidence as above. So that was, that was the reason I kind of included this to, to illustrate that. So now going back to this idea of treatments. So we have this graph where we're looking at, okay, how reversible versus permanent is the treatment and how general versus focal is the treatment. How do we use this? So I can tell you that I think about this, this um, specific graph for pretty much every patient I see with spasticity. And I'll, I'm going to go through some examples where you can apply this thinking very easily to a patient, po a patient population. And then sometimes where it gets gray. And, and you'll see what I mean when I go through these. So the first example is someone with a, uh, a spastic limb. So it may not be actually the only one limb is spastic, but the idea is that we only really are trying to target one limb for a number of reasons. That could be anything. This very easy example that I think most people understand is writer's cramp. So true writer's cramp where someone writes and their muscles in their hands contract and cannot 
be relaxed, actually will physically open up their hand to break the, the tension is what we call focal dystonia. So it's a it's a intermittent contraction of muscles that's involuntary. Um, the first line treatment for almost everybody, some places, some insurance companies make you try oral medication is, is botulinum toxin. Again, right, it's a very small area. You don't wanna give somebody oral medication that goes everywhere they're gonna have side effects from potentially like sedation or other things like that. Botulinum toxin is targeted, you know, so stretching is usually the first thing and if that doesn't work, botulinum toxin because you can inject it into only the specific muscles it comes up in. And you don't have to worry about other, other you know, bad effects from botulinum toxin about where you have too high of doses or things like that, because it's very targeted. Uh, so this is a good example of why, how that graph, right? You push somebody into that bottom left quadrant of, you know, you really want something that's not permanent frequently and you want something that is uh, uh, pretty focal because it's only on one part of the body. The opposite example is spastic tetraparesis. So, so someone who has spasticity in all four limbs, you know, maybe also their trunk and their head and neck, or this is spasticity is everywhere. Targeted treatments frequently are not a great option because they're just frankly ineffective, right? One, from a, a uh, personal care of people perspective, I don't want to inject someone with botulinum toxin in every muscle of their body. That just doesn't work. One, I'm limited in the ceiling doses of botulinum toxin, but then secondly, it's just not comfortable for anybody. And so you're, it's, it's frequently ineffective. So people that have spastic tetraparesis that we're doing botulinum toxin, it's usually because we're using it for a targeted approach. Maybe it's specifically for dressing. So we're trying to get their arms to abduct a little easier, their elbows to get a little bit straighter or similar kinds of goals for their legs. Or it's because we're doing some other treatment that effect that is effective for the whole parts of their body, but there are some refractory areas, like maybe their hands are so really tight. And so we need to target that with botulinum toxin. But as I as indicated, right, things that go most parts of the body can be very effective here, can be kind of the first line, right? So oral medication medications, intrathecal baclofen, those are really great options a lot of times for patients that have fairly global spasticity. Now we get into the kind of ones where it gets gray, right? So it's the, this is a little bit of a dance of trying to figure out what is the best option for these kinds of patients. So uh, the next is spastic hemiparesis. So obviously extremely common in the brain injury population, Cerebral palsy population, also very common. Um, this depends a lot on the severity of their spasticity. People that have severe globally hemi uh, spasticity, meaning that their whole half of their body is spastic, not just like their hand and foot. Frequently, similar to someone who has tetraparesis, botulinum toxin just, you can't get enough in enough places. Sometimes you can, but it, it can be limited. But then patients that do have maybe just limited spasticity, so it's just in their hand and their foot or things like that, then sometimes you don't want to subject them to an oral medication with side effects uh, such as sedation or other things like that. And then again, maybe it's you're only trying to improve one activity. And so treatment of the spasticity for their arm is just doesn't matter. You only want to treat their leg because you're only looking at walking or transfers or the opposite. You know, there's someone who that you're not going to change very much with botulinum toxin or other kinds of focal treatments. So you want to target just their arm that might change the way you use a targeted approach such as botulinum toxin. And then the last example is, is spastic diplegia. So, uh, you know, in the brain injury world, this is extremely uncommon. This happens basically in cerebral palsy, but then also in, in spinal cord injury, it's very common. And this again has the same kind of problems. You know, if they have severe globally spastic diplegic, meaning that their legs are extremely spastic throughout their legs, targeted approaches can be very difficult to get in efficacious uh, treatment. But if it's minimal, um, or if you're really only trying to target a couple things, it can be, it can work. Otherwise you try to do a little more global treatments such as uh, uh, oral medications um, or intrathecal baclofen. And then one thing is, you know, that uh, spastic diplegia specifically in the cerebral palsy population, this was the population that was originally, I shouldn't say designed, but thought of for, for the selective dorsal rhizotomy. And so this is a, this is a population we frequently think about that as a more permanent treatment for people that have severe spasticity in, in both legs. So that's a, a lot of kind of coverage over the thinking process of um, different medications, different kinds of treatments, injectable treatments, surgical treatments, the thought process that I go through when I'm, I'm seeing a patient, both of their examination, where spasticity is, how severe that is, how I assess severity of spasticity, and then how I'm thinking why I would do one thing versus the other. I hope, I hope that's helpful. Uh, the big thing is being right that clinical measurement is difficult. I kind of highlighted that in the sense that these are relatively vague scales and the less vague scales are difficult to do at the, at the bedside. 
Um, but they're helpful in the sense that they kind of push us down different pathways if they're more severe or less severe. And then finally, the biggest thing being probably that treatment should be tailored towards goals. We should think about goals because if we don't think about goals, I, I I'll tell you from my experience, we frequently find ourselves in situations where a, an effect happened. So there was a change in spasticity, yet the improvement in that patient's life through that change is unclear. And so if someone's coming in every three to six months for botulinum toxin injections or to refill a baclofen pump, and we just don't know that it was that helpful. That's not a situation I want to be in. It's frequently not a situation that a patient wants to be in or, or a family. And so that's why thinking about what the goal is of trying to treat specificity is, is really important. Uh, one thing I didn't highlight in this presentation because I didn't want to open up too big of a, a can with this as well is that treatment of spasticity in children is very different than that of adults in that the growing skeleton is a is a different uh, phenomenon and different um, sets of problems that can come up. Unlike the skeletally mature patient who does not have uh, any more skeletal growth left, and that's because just like trees, bones grow with forces applied to them and will grow differently if those forces are different. So someone with spasticity and different forces will have their bones grow differently, which changes the way we think about this for kids than we do for adults. Uh, or I shouldn't say for adults, but for people that are skeletally mature, so teens really included in that. Um, and so that should be something else that's considered in the goal, right? Because their musculoskeletal development is a goal. Um, so I'm, I'm going to hang it on this slide for a second, just so for people that want to uh, see these different references, um, uh, the one I want to highlight specifically is that number five, or number four, number five, number four specifically for cerebral palsy, talking about kind of this thinking process for spasticity, including that graph. And then number five with that traffic light evidence, which I think is a really awesome way to look at uh, the evidence and how it exists for a range of different interventions for spasticity, again, specifically in cerebral palsy, but it definitely has the most data behind it for spasticity in children. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank, thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to come and talk. And uh, hopefully I'll get to see everybody when we can meet in person again. Thanks.